I had a plan for how this episode was going to go. I was going to talk about isekai anime, and the seemingly vice-like grip it has on the anime subculture at the moment. I was going to talk about online gaming, and the sudden returning surge of World of Warcraft. And it was all going to surround and center Dot Hack Sign. But then I rewatched the series. And that's where it went all horribly wrong. I am damn skippy that most of you out there remember Dot Hack Sign and the ensuing PS2 JRPGs that surround it. But looking back on the meta series, it's actually pretty impressive what Bondi managed to do, even by the standards of today's day and age. Originally conceived by game studio CyberConnect2, the neatly titled Project Dot Hack originally encompassed four games. Dot Hack Infection, Mutation, Outbreak, and Quarantine, with an anime series Dot Hack Sign running alongside the game's releases through 2002 into 2003. That's right, I said releases. During the course of its original run, they managed to release the first two games, with the last two games coming in just under seven months. Madden doesn't release games this fast. Well, to call them sequels would be kind of stretching it, they were more like continuations of the same story. Chapters, if you will. If you were feeling charitable, you would call it a tetralogy in the vein of Lord of the Rings. If you weren't, you'd call it glorified DLC at 50 bucks a pop. Not gonna say which side I'm on, but I will say that it doesn't surprise me that CyberConnect 2 would go on to develop Asra's Wrath. If you get it, you get it. Still, the series was an expensive gamble for a developer to shoot so high when they had achieved only some modest success, but their bets were hedged by the inclusion of series composition writer and shepherd Kazunori Ito. Ito has been around the anime block since the 80s, penning classics like Urusei Yatsura, Dirty Pair, Pat Labor, and the original Ghost in the Shell film. And I really hate that I have to make that distinction now. Ito provided the narrative meat, as it were, for the franchise and its many incarnations, and has more or less been involved with the series up until the present day, so I believe it's fair to say that Dot Hack is his baby. As for CyberConnect 2, well, despite mediocre reviews and some fan backlash aimed at the lack of improvement between games, they would ride the success of Dot Hack and parlaying it into a future of making dozens of Naruto and JoJo's Bizarre Adventure games. Oh, and apparently they were involved with a remake of some other JRPG, but uh... We won't get into that. Really, the success of the JRPGs had little to do with the games themselves and more to do with the time they were released. It's a classic example of being in the right place at the right time. We might joke today about the internet being the wild frontier, but in the early 2000s, it truly was just that. Broadband internet was slowly starting to take shape, which not only allowed more people to be online, but also expanded what people could do online. This was the heyday of many an online RPG. Your Ultima Onlines, your Final Fantasy XI's, your Evercraft, I mean, quests. It was the new hotness that heralded how the game industry was going to evolve and take shape, for better and certainly for worse. So during this time of exciting technological development, in comes this game that's ostensibly about an MMORPG that's causing its players to go into comas, and the only way to solve this mystery is to play the game within the game. Ultra postmodernism. Love it. It might have been 2002, but gaming as a whole was still catching up with other artistic media in terms of meta narrative and the fascination thereof. But while it's a seeming inevitability that art in all its forms will touch upon this device in waves of popularity that come and go, it's fair to say that video games can use said device in ways that other media cannot, simply because of its interactive nature. After all, the concept of a game and the innate notion of player control is rife with possibilities of subversion. A man chooses. A slave obeys. In essence, Dot Hack was one of the very first widely released video games that was about playing a video game, and creating an anime based off such a concept would prove to be way more influential than even Ito could have possibly imagined. It's difficult to understate just how much of a presence that isekai anime has on the anime landscape today, but to sum it all up in one thought, when they make an entire anime series that's just a huge crossover of several isekai anime, we've reached peak saturation. But to trace a path to get to where we are, with our collective, unshakable obsession with being transported to another world, you have to go through series like Dot Hack, as well as Monster Rancher. One day, mark my words, 
So, by now, I hope you can understand why I really did have high hopes in having a meaty discussion about gaming, escapism, and postmodernism. From the outside looking in, you can almost see the pieces start coming together. But then, as I said, you actually watch the series, and the only question you're left with is... Wait, did anything even happen? I cannot impart upon all of you just how truly disappointed I was after sitting down to watch this series and then realizing that there's just not enough here. And the real kicker is that I saw this series before, back during the limbo days of adult-oriented anime on Cartoon Network. Long story short, Adult Swim stopped calling their Saturday night action block Adult Swim for a bit, and Dot Hack Sign was one of the few new shows they were broadcasting during that time. Granted, I hadn't seen Dot Hack Sign since its first broadcast, and 15 years can do a number on anyone's memory, but woo This is going to be rough. This is Dot Hack Sign. Actually, this is the world, and no, that is not a JoJo reference. It's the video game that has swept the globe and has something to the tune of 20 million players, or about one twelfth the audience of Fortnite. <laughs> And just like your typical MMO, the game is pretty free range for players to just kind of pedal around and defeat monsters, take on quests, and gather that fat, fat loot. But for Tsukasa, he has more pressing matters at hand. You mean to tell me you can't log out? Looks that way. Though you couldn't guess just how pressing it is if you went by Tsukasa's, well, anything really. Yes, for somebody who has no memory of their life outside the game, a game they also can't leave, Tsukasa seems oddly apathetic to the situation, only shaking out of his muted reverie to run away from other players and monsters. Despite that, the plot keeps nipping at his heels by way of other players taking an intense curiosity to his situation, as well as the game-breaking guardian that's at Tsukasa's disposal. <laughs> But there you have, wrapped up in a neat little bow, the premise of Dot Hack Sign. A boy with a mysterious past wakes up to find himself in a virtual reality with no chance of escape. So you're starting to think that maybe this anime is going to be a fantasy adventure with tinges of action and sci-fi, right? <laughs> nope! However, I'm really not exaggerating. I'm telling you the truth, and it happened just yesterday. You realize that systematically- I'm in a place like this. Because this field and Tsukasa are and both- most people were even able to read it in the first place. Then there was the fact that it was deleted very quickly. Oh, sweet summer child has the coin landed tails on you. No, no, no. Remember, this is a Kazunori Ito script, and the man is as eclectic as a mariachi death metal band. Between penning anime series, the man has also written scripts for Gamera movies and even wrote a section for the anthology film Necronomicon. But the common link between his many works is his attention to character and introspective dialogue. You've got human brain cells in that titanium shell of yours. You're treated like other humans, so stop with the angst. But that's just it. That's the only thing that makes me feel human. It's actually more accurate to classify Dot Hack Sign as a character slash mood piece dressed up in sword and sorcery garb. But while that's more fair to say, it does not augur well for this production. If you've been watching the footage, instead of opening up another tab to scroll through Facebook, Josh, then you have noted that the anime looks kind of bleh, doesn't it? Well, that's because the animation was headed by our good friends at B-Train, known for other video game anime like Wild Arms and Ark the Lad, as well as other fondly remembered titles like Metabots and Spider Riders. When the wicked rise, the word goes out, calling all spider riders! Eh, paycheck's a paycheck. B-Train as a studio had a bit of notoriety for being... parsimonious, to put it kindly. And that was especially true during the earlier days of its existence. Simple colors, line work, limited animation, and many a cut corner are the staples of a B-Train anime. And nowhere is it more apparent than Dot Hack's sign. B-Train always figured that their money was better spent on the intro of their anime rather than the anime itself. And true to form, Dot Hack Sign's intro is pretty classic even to this day.
And that's about as much as I can play before Victor Entertainment comes a knocking. YouTube content ID, open up! It's a real shame too, because the intro is only as good as it is because of the music. All throughout the show, the music is the standout feature, mixing strings, choral tones, and electronica to create this otherworldly sound that's reminiscent of soundtracks like Nier, the original one, mind you, and Chrono Cross. And if you're making music that's reminiscent of either one of these video games, you're doing something right. The problem is that despite the, at times, beautiful music, the anime uses it almost exclusively as a sound bed that only winds up distracting the viewer from the complete lack of animation and sleepwalking direction. The director of Dot Hack Sign is Koichi Mashimo, the founder of B-Train, and he certainly directs like a guy who knows exactly how much money is being spent on the project. A small budget isn't necessarily a death knell for anime production, so long as it can be guided by a clever direction to overcome its limitations. Heck, the industry was founded on such notions, but here in Dot Hack, the non existent direction only highlights the lack of budget. Scene after scene of characters talking off screen, so no lip flaps have to be timed. Shots that are held on for way too long, with only a small camera pan to let the audience know that their DVD isn't skipping. Actions and events that are talked about afterward instead of being shown, reused and abused settings that show up way past their sell-by date, flashbacks to previous episodes that literally, no joke, no exaggeration, go on for over a minute and a half. It's almost comical just how many shortcuts B-Train used to make this anime. And what's worse is that all of these shortcuts are being used to make a character study which can only really reinforce the problems and make them completely unavoidable. It's a real pisser because we already know what an Edo penned character study can look like in better suited hands. Ghost of the Shell, despite having a more robust budget, still had many a scene where nothing much is really happening except for the characters opining on life and existence. And yet the director, Mamoru Oshi, knew how to frame and animate the dialogue in a compelling way without breaking the bank. Why did you pick me? Because we are more alike than you realize. This isn't to say that Mashimo is a bad director or anything, but in the face of constraint, he opts for the shortcuts instead of trying to work with it. And Dot Hack is worse off because of it. Still, I have to feel that even if Mashimo managed to pull off a miracle and made 100 yen look like 1000 yen, the anime is still shackled to the idea of it being a character piece. And this is where one of the main fundamental problems with the show lies. Because, as a character study, Dot Hack is pretty dang dull and lifeless. I don't know. Hey, Dr. Cortez? Yeah, it's me. Uh, I don't think I'll be needing my ambient prescription anymore. Yeah, I've been watching Dot Hack. How'd you guess? For what I said about Tsukasa, you might assume that he would be a pretty boring character, but unless you've seen Dot Hack Sign, then you don't know how right you are. Seeing as how the early 2000s were still smack dab in the middle of what most anime historians call the Shinji era, Tsukasa is, well, a mopey, down on himself wet blanket who utterly refuses to have any kind of proactive presence in the plot. But I would like it if you would just leave me alone from now on, okay? So what are you gonna do now? I won't do anything. Why do you run? Because I think it's fun. How enthralling. But there is a logic to his whining. The story sets up Tsukasa as this dangerous player who is breaking the rules of the game with his guardian, but at no point is he actively malicious about his abuse of the system. He just kind of floats around on the breeze and he gets pestered by the Crimson Knights. Glorified GMs that are players that have volunteered their time. Think Guardian Angels from Always Sunny, only with less accountability. Please tell me, what are the reasons that made you decide that Tsukasa is innocent? Please tell all of us. Who do you think you are? I'm sorry, but don't these guys have like actual jobs? Like hauling freight in EVE Online? At least the Crimson Knights act as a kind of antagonistic force for Tsukasa. But by the end of the first act, they're relegated to being a complete non-factor because their leader, Subaru, proclaims Tsukasa to be off-limits. And then he just kind of accidentally his way through the remainder of the story, always being led by other characters and never by his own drive. Just like the world itself, he is directionless and without any kind of real agency. The only arc his character has is that he has to learn to want to actually leave the world. It's now clear. After all. 
Now I don't have to return to that ludicrous world. On the surface, this looks like an examination of why people completely abandon the real world to sink their lives into online video games, which was, and still kind of is, a real concern. But the problem is that the series doesn't really do anything with it. Spoilers from here on out. Throughout the series, you get slight glimpses of who Tsukasa is outside the game, like the fact that the player controlling him is actually a girl in a coma named An Shoji, who was abused by her father. So we do have a strong foundation for why An would want to be lost in the fictional world of... the world, but unfortunately her character development is placed squarely on the back burner in favor of the show's incredibly weak mythos. Tsukasa spends long stretches of the show just laying around waiting for the other characters to find him or for his captors Morgana and Maha to goad him further into despair. The actual drive of the story is the history of the game, especially the history surrounding a mythical game-breaking item that everyone wants called the Key of the Twilight. Any news on someone obtaining a hidden item? I know you know what I mean. The Key of the Twilight will soon be ours, but you have to hurry up. I think the mystery of the Key of the Twilight will be answered for all of us as well. So what is the key of the twilight? Nobody knows! Since nobody knows what it is or even if it exists at all, the time spent on characters just talking endlessly about what it could be and what it could possibly do is the utter height of mental masturbation. They're all thinking about the possibilities rather than the reality. The key of the twilight, don't you want it? Hmm, does it actually exist? Hell, the show straight up admits that the characters don't even know what they would do if they found the damn thing. You must begin searching for the key of the twilight. And when I find it? Do I even have to tell all of you how much of a time waster this is? Especially when it's revealed that everyone is wrong? It's never really confirmed as such, but it is heavily implied and backed up by the ensuing PS2 games that the key is actually a girl named Ara, a hyper-advanced AI that the creator of the game made to honor the daughter he never had with a dead woman that never loved him. She is my... She is, my, she is she our is hope. hope. In her In lies her the dreams, dreams of all of us. us. Yikes. Well, good luck with all that. <laughs> if you didn't catch that... The Game of the World was created by a German programmer named Harold Horwick, who was in love with a woman named Emma Wyland, who was already involved with another man. She died, and his response is to build an entire massively multiplayer online role-playing game that would secretly develop a perfect AI representation of the daughter that he would have had with Emma. And yet, this is still somehow less creepy than what you usually get up to in your Sims game, Josh! And what does this have to do with On? Very, very little. It just so happens that a program called Morgana was tasked with overseeing Ara's development, but she put two and two together and realized that if Ara woke up, there would be no point to her existence. So she found Tsukasa, realized he was a wet blanket, and tricked him into shackling himself to the world, and thus somehow keeping Ara asleep and delaying her awakening. Am I the only one here left thinking, wait, that's it? I mean, to say nothing of the silly nature of such a concept, it smacks of such poor planning on the writing's part. It just winds up treating Tsukasa and An as completely incidental. After all, if Morgana can trap anyone into a coma and feed off their antisocial negative emotions and even brainwash them to the point where they completely forget what their life on the outside was even like, then what makes An so special? Just capture any of the other 19,999,999 players. How could you even fail? So, depending on your viewpoint, An was just the right wrong person at the right wrong time. And that completely kneecaps her in her story. Sure, you could stretch the story and concede as a parable about how games can trap people of a certain disposition into giving up their life and become addicted and withdrawn from society. But games don't do that by reminding the player just how much the world sucks. They do it by portraying a world that's more inviting and rewarding than the real world. You would have to be brainwashed to want to stay with Ara in this secluded part of the game for seemingly months on end, doing, once again, absolutely nothing. At least second jobs and MMOs make you feel like you're doing something. What's the world's excuse? At the end, we're supposed to want to see An wake up from her coma and live a loving, happy life. 
but we never really know her as On. We only know her as Tsukasa, an unlucky avatar who spends over half the anime not even wanting to wake up for reasons we can't even grasp until much later in the series. All for the sake of a backstory that is as creepy as it is long-winded as it is stupid. Yeah, dot hack sign? It's not good. Even the supporting cast can't escape the seemingly endless droning plot progression. Doesn't help that about half the cast talk with the same amount of lethargy, apathy, and out and out can't give a crap itis. Well, I had a hunch that you would know, Subaru. Unfortunately. I see. So are you blaming me? No, no. The opposite. The opposite? I'm actually thankful. I've seen dead fish livelier than these buttholes. But it's not just that the majority of the cast are these dialed down, barely registering mouth breathers. It's that all of them seem to make decisions and come to conclusions on the whim of the plot and nothing else. Take Mimiru, for instance. She begins her relationship with Tsukasa, prickling at each other, mainly because Tsukasa just wants to be left alone. So you'll really leave me alone then, will you? I'll just ignore you. And we'll just go our separate ways. <laughs> ah! <sighs> But just a couple episodes later, that is completely forgotten, and now Mimiru is really concerned about Tsukasa, you guys. You're wrong! I keep telling you that's not it! I'm concerned about your well-being. You liar! <gasps> why the sudden about-face? No, I'm asking, why the sudden about-face? You're really a bright girl. No, sir. I'm just a moron. Actually, if we're grading on a curve, you're one of the brighter bulbs in the box, Mimiru. Now, BT, on the other hand. Ah, yes, an aloof sorceress that always seems to be orbiting around the main plot without actually affecting it in one way or another. BT is pretty emblematic of the kind of character writing that plagues the series overall. Always scheming and playing multiple sides against each other, BT is just hard to get a handle of. Not because of how complex her characterization is, but rather because she keeps making decisions that goes against all logic. Your member address, please. Last chance. <laughs> Not a chance. That's truly a shame. Hmm, a man who player killed me and is constantly lying to the other people around him because he's a trash goblin that loves to see other people miserable. Let's team up! I didn't think you'd actually come. To be honest, I didn't want to. And yet, here you are. This kind of thick-headed dumbassery would be even more egregious than it is if the anime didn't make it plainly obvious that none of this even matters. While I could go on and on about the constant, dumb, mystifying decisions that each and every character makes, Subaru, you got off lucky, the nadir of the show is the fact that it just cannot give dramatic weight to its story, because it keeps reminding us that this is all taking place in a video game. Lady Subaru, the world is only a game for play. Huh? <laughs> I guess if this was the real world, I would say, you don't look well. This is bad. For a minute, I actually forgot that this was a game that we were all playing together. So again, I ask, what are the stakes? I mean, I get why Tsukasa has skin in the game, but what about everybody else? What is the danger to them, if any? If someone is killed in the game, they just go back to their previous point where they last saved. Annoying, yes, but hardly worth the dramatic weight the show wants to throw behind it. In essence, every single death and dot hack sign just comes off like this. But wait, I hear some of you asking, what about the unkillable monsters that look like Tsukasa's guardian that are sending players into comas in real life? Surviving! Since when do the monsters have these kind of abilities? This is very bad. Oh, you mean the monsters that show up in the beginning of the series and then completely disappear from the narrative for 15 episodes where they need to reappear for the finale? Those monsters? Yeah, they're almost a complete non-factor. Especially when it's revealed that they're not nearly as unkillable as they've been made out to be. But you know, you can get away with a lot in your story just so long as you wow them in the end. So tell me, Dot Hexine, where are we going? Well, as we drive past cameos from characters that we would have no idea who they were if we didn't play the video games, Tsukasa snaps out of his reverie and manages to escape with Ara, but not before Morgana sends out her heavy to stop them. But Helba, again you'd have to play the games, just deletes everything and hits restart. 
Ara is awakened, An is awakened, and she and the real life Subaru meet for the first time and begin a heavily implied relationship with Morgana still lurking in the shadows. Play the game to get the real ending! Once again, if you get it, you get it. And that was the ending for a while. Until Bondi released an OVA after the series and video games concluded, where the cast of the show and the games finally meet and have a Big American Party! Yay! Everybody disco dancing! Lots of fun, good time for all! I'm having very good time! This shindig looks like the bomb diggity. This anime sucks! Look, I'm willing to give Dot .hack a lot of credit where it's due. It was a bold experiment as far as meta-series go, and it does have a lasting impact on the anime world as a whole, even if the actual game part has largely fallen by the wayside here in the States. But be that as it may, it doesn't stop the anime itself from being dull, nonsensical, and listless. And as the years go by where copies of the original PS2 games are harder and harder to come by, the gaps in the story meant to be filled in later by them become that much more of a problem. True, you can't fault CyberConnect 2 or Bondi for not having the prescience to know that game preservation is a complete joke, but it remains a real and unavoidable obstacle for new viewers. As a stepping stone toward what anime would become, Dot Hack Sign has its place, and it is an important one. But the merits of the anime itself leave a lot to be desired. It was formative, it was influential, but that doesn't mean it was good. Watch only for its historical significance, and not much else. Now, as for what's up next here on Anime Abandon, well, I have a feeling it's going to involve a whole lot of tears. Till next time.